I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. In this podcast, we explore America's crisis in civic education. Too many people today don't understand the history and principles that make us Americans. So we're here to explore America's history and principles and what they mean for today, what we can learn from them, and how we can restore them to their rightful place in our hearts and minds. We think it's the most important thing we can do as Americans to keep our experiment in self-government alive. So thank you for joining us in this important conversation. You can learn more about Ashbrook and the work we're doing with students, teachers, and citizens at ashbrook.org. I want to welcome everyone to this episode of The American Idea. Today, we're going to be talking about a book with, I think I'll call it a provocative title, um, an interesting and important book uh, on a very important figure in American history, probably someone today that many of our listeners have heard of, but don't know uh, enough about, given his significance uh, and effect in the course on the course of American history. Uh, we're going to be talking today about John C. Calhoun. We're going to be doing that with uh, a friend of uh, American history, a great scholar of American history, Professor Robert Elder. He teaches history at Baylor University, an absolutely terrific university. A number of our Ashbrook grads and friends are at Baylor, uh, and it has be it is. Uh, one of the premier institutions of higher education in the United States, takes scholarship and teaching very seriously. So it is an honor to have with us today Professor Robert Elder, who received his PhD from Emory University and is one of the eminent scholars in the United States on 19th century America, and in particular on John C. Calhoun. Professor Robert Elder, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's wonderful to be here. I'm a big fan of the podcast and everything y'all do at the Ashbrook Center. Um, the title of the book. Our, I want to re first of all, I want to recommend this book to our listeners. It is a terrific book. It's serious. It's in depth. But unlike a lot of academic history, if you'll pardon me saying this, your book reads wonderfully <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> it, yeah, it's it the kind of book a person can pick up and just get into the story and they are going to devour this book i appreciate that yeah that was that was certainly my goal with the book was to write something readable especially since it evens out uh you know somewhere over 500 pages <laughs> that's right it's not it's not the it's not the reading of of an afternoon on the beach but <laughs> no no definitely but, not Again, to our listeners, let me strongly recommend you pick up Professor Elder's book. Explain to folks the title. Yeah, so the title uh, of the book is Calhoun, American Heretic. And um, I, have to, uh, I have to give credit to my editor, actually, for, uh, for that title. I, it was something I'd used in the book proposal to describe Calhoun's place in, in um, American history, and he picked up on that. And I really warmed to it because I think uh, it gets at two things that I wanted to do in the book. Um, one of which was to show, I mean, in, in a sense, some people have pointed out, it, the title doesn't fit some of what I argue in the book. Because part of what I argue is that Calhoun was incredibly central to American history uh, in the first half of the 19th century, and that he was... Um, that, that he was also fundamentally in the mainstream about some things. But it also gets at something that I argue in the book, which is that Calhoun, in at least two areas in particular, his, his constitutional theories and his defense of slavery, Calhoun was viewed as sort of a heretic in his own time by some people. Um, and th that despite his prominence, he did have ideas that some people viewed as radical. Um, and, th and so we can get into that part maybe later. The other part of it I thought was um, how Calhoun is viewed today. 
which is that he's sort of um, placed outside American history. He serves as a sort of foil. Uh, frequently, we we uh, some people might not want to include him and some of his ideas, particularly his defense of slavery in uh, in American history. And I think uh, it, I, I wanted to sort of capture that uh, the way that he functions in sort of our public memory of our history which is just kind of odd because he's um he was one of the most important figures of the of 19th century american political history and uh and, and yet you know today he's sort of viewed as um as outside of that or foreign to that um so the the title gets at that it was a useful way to talk about a few things um uh, about calhoun but i i'm also uh I also sort of agree with some of the people who said, well, you actually argue that he was really important and central to uh, to history. Well, true, true enough. We can't, you know, titles can't do all the work they need to do. <laughs> you mentioned in his time, uh, a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, know something about Calhoun, but for, for them and for others who may not know his biography very well, who was John C. Calhoun? Yeah, that's a great question. So the 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 way that I first uh, sometimes talk about this is, if you had asked Americans um, during the middle decades of the 19th century, let's say the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s, if you had asked most Americans, uh, you know, to list five people in American public life who had not yet been president but would be in their lifetimes. John C. Calhoun would have been on almost every one of those lists. Um, he was uh, an incredibly prominent political figure. Um, he is uh, from South Carolina. He's born in 1782 in the upcountry of South Carolina to Scots Irish Presbyterian parents. His he was a he was a second generation American. His father was from Ulster. Uh, had come over on the boat uh, in the mid 18th century. They ended up in South Carolina. Uh, he attends Yale uh, College, uh, which is an interesting choice for somebody with his political uh, leanings. Um, attends Litchfield Law School, is elected to the House of Representatives in 1811, becomes one of the so-called war hawks along with Henry Clay during the War of 1812. That is the sort of, that, that's his first real entrance into national uh, prominence is during the War of 1812. Um, then he goes on to be Secretary of War uh, under uh, James Monroe from 1817 to 1824. Then he's Vice President twice. I, the, people always find this interesting under two very different presidents, um, first under John Quincy Adams and then under Andrew Jackson. Wow, that's uh, but, very unusual. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think when I I have to explain to my students how the electoral system worked in the 1820s and how that could have been possible, uh, and you know today it would be like I, I explain it like it would be like Kamala Harris being vice president to Donald Trump and Joe Biden, <laughs> you know, which we we can't really we we can't really conceive of how that could happen, um, but it could. Uh, then he has a he has a an incredibly public and important uh, falling out with Andrew Jackson during the nullification crisis, and is elected during that crisis to the U.S. Senate by South Carolina, um, and that's where he spends the rest of his career. That's what he's probably most famous for. He does a he does one stint uh, as Secretary of State under John Tyler. Uh, where he's instrumental in bringing Texas uh, into the United States, um, but but he he uh, his main reputation is as a U.S. senator. Um, that's where he spent the majority of his time, and I think what he what he's most famous for. And he ran for president um, twice, uh, seriously twice, eighteen twenty four and eighteen forty four. Well, I mean, when you recount his biography in that way, and you talk about him serving, for example, in the Monroe administration. It doesn't sound like the makings of a heretic. It sounds like someone who's inside the church, well inside the American political tradition, the Democratic Republican Party. Um, it, it doesn't sound like someone who is going to um, break fundamentally with people like Jefferson or Madison or Monroe. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, that is mostly right about Calhoun all the way up until the late 1820s when the issue of the tariff of 1828 becomes the consuming political issue of the um, on the American political scene. And South Carolina's stance on that pulls Calhoun in a more in, in the direction that he will go for the rest of his career, which is sort of outside some of the mainstreams of American politics. But up until the 18, late 1820s, he was utterly um, in the mainstream. He was ascendant. Um, he was uh, quite popular. Um, there are, I, I, you know, there are some hints during the, during the War of 1812, Calhoun and, and the Warhawks do depart in significant ways from the old Republican, Democratic Republican orthodoxies of the 1790s. So, you know, there's this split during the War of 1812 between the sort of tertium quids, piece, people like John Randolph, who hold to this older states' rights, small government oriented uh, philosophy. And Calhoun actually, although he identifies as a as a Democrat, as a follower of Jefferson, not as a Federalist, um, Calhoun departs from that significantly during the war uh, and, and is in favor of taxation and all the raising an army, all the things that you need to do to fight a war. Um, and he's remarkably willing to just jettison many of the, the orthodoxies of his party. And so there are people in the party at that point who point to him and say, this guy is, <laughs> you know, he's already, um, he's already leaving the fold. He's doing these new things, innovating in ways that we don't, you know, that we don't like. John Randolph did not like uh, Calhoun. They never they never got along very well, huh. um, but so, it's so really. Let me ask you this then: Why is if this is the beginning of what you might see some heretical strains, we might call them, um, in eighteen twelve? Why is John C. Calhoun such a war hawk? What is it yeah. about the War of eighteen twelve that really seems to grab him? Yeah, well, I think um, I think like Henry Clay, they they go on to be you know, in some cases, political allies against Andrew Jackson, and then in other cases, enemies. But like Henry Clay, and like a lot of American politicians, I mean, um, I think Calhoun grasps the existential stakes of the War of 1812. Um, and he says later in his career, <clears throat> excuse me, he says later in his career, um, that, you know, the threat during the War of 1812 was an external threat. And that uh, the mark of a good politician, a wise statesman, is to respond to circumstance, right? To be to to be somewhat malleable in response to circumstance. And the, of course, this is something that Edmund Burke would have said as well. And um, and so he, his argument is: when there was an external threat, I was willing to do what was necessary to save the country from that external threat. I think you also have to factor in a deep-seated fear and antipathy to England uh, based on his Scots-Irish <laughs> heritage. Uh, uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I think that had a lot to do with it as well. So from then, from 1812, as you said, until the late 1820s, he's in many ways in the mainstream, one of the most important politicians and public figures in the country. Uh, some of our listeners will know a lot about the nullification crisis in 18 in the early 1830s and some won't tell us what happens and why that has such an important effect on Calhoun sure well one of the one of the arguments in the early republic is over uh not surprising we're still arguing over taxation today but it was it was over taxation and specifically the issue of <clears throat> how the, the federal government could use tariffs, uh, whether they could use tariffs to protect American industries. <clears throat> so a tariff, of course, is just a tax on foreign in importation. The federal government passes several of these, uh, one in 1816, which Calhoun supports, one in 1824, and then most famously uh, in 1828. And the, the point of these <clears throat> 
from the perspective of their supporters was to tax foreign goods coming into the country in order to protect domestic manufacturing in case there was another war. And this is why Calhoun initially supported it in 1816, which he takes a lot of grief for later. Um, by 1828, as the external threat seems to be fading, the objection is that um, constitutionally, uh, the, the opponents of the tariff feel that it's unconstitutional to use tariffs simply for uh, uh, protecting uh, specific industries like the woolen industry or the cotton textile industry or the iron industry. Um, that, that it amounts to a government handout essentially to specific um, industries. And the heart of the opposition to that tariff uh, is in South Carolina, Calhoun's home state. Uh, so he is vice president um, under John Quincy Adams, and then really when it erupts under Andrew Jackson. Um, and in 1828, um, the South Carolina legislature asks Calhoun to author a response um, to an opposition to the tariff. And he, he agrees to do it um, because he had been moving in his own thinking towards the side of the argument that, that the tariff was unconstitutional, that the government could use it for general revenue as long, it was, as, long as it was evenly distributed but that the tariff of 1828 in particular, as it operated, was protecting certain industries that were mostly concentrated in the North. And it was the burden of the taxation was mainly falling on Southern states who were slave states. Therefore, they were export oriented in their economy and they had to import uh, almost everything that they consumed in everyday life and so the, the foreign export, the tax on foreign exports fell disproportionately on Southern states. And so that, that was, uh, Calhoun's argument was that that was unconstitutional. And he had been drifting that way a little bit in his constitutional thinking. It, it's clear in his letters, he had become more sympathetic to that as he grew uh, older. Um, but it's also true that, although Calhoun never acknowledged this, that politically, if he wanted to stay on the national stage, he had to move with his base of support in South Carolina. And um, so Calhoun authors this, he authors anonymously at first the, in 1828, what's known as the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, where he lays out why the tariff is con unconstitutional and for the first time, he raises or proposes this process whereby a state could nullify a federal law. Uh, and he has a very well-defined constitutional uh, process for how that would work. It's not a new idea in American history. He's, he's referring back to 1798 when Thomas Jefferson and James Madison authored the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and they, they used the word nullification Jefferson raises the idea of a state interposing its authority between uh, its citizens and the John Adams administration at that point, which had passed these Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, but nobody had ever defined how this would work constitutionally. It was sort of something that a lot of Jefferson's political heirs uh, gave lip service to, but nobody had worked out the constitutional process. And that's what Calhoun does in the late 1820s and early 1830s. That's his real, one of his real contributions to arguments about constitution. Well, that, that strikes me as very remarkable because you have a sitting vice president arguing against a bill. Presumably Andrew Jackson supports the tariff bill. Yeah, Jackson is, uh, Jackson is uh, unpredictable on the tariff bill as he, as he was on, on so much else. Nobody knew exactly how Jackson was going to react to South Carolina's challenge uh, until he did until he actually did react. And what what ends up happening, although nobody was sure what would happen, what ends up happening is Jackson comes out very strongly against the tariff uh, or sorry, against nullification. So he may or may not like the tariff, but he's definitely against nullification. He's a strong nationalist 
uh, response, at least to the tariff. Now, so does could, that set John C. Calhoun publicly at odds with the president? Yes, uh, one, especially once it becomes widely known that Calhoun was actually the author of this 1828 document. And then he comes out publicly in 1831 uh, and gives what's known as the Fort Hill Address, where he elaborates on this. And at that point, the break with Jackson is, is complete, uh, more or less. And this had all begun. I mean, there's a personal, as there usually is, there's a personal aspect and backstory to many of these fights and divisions, right? So even though they were at times political allies, um, Jackson and Calhoun had a, had a history that went all the way back to the Monroe administration, <clears throat> uh, which was that when Andrew Jackson uh, basically invaded Florida during the Monroe administration. He invades Florida, which at that time was a Spanish colony, um, and nearly provokes a war with Spain, and also executes two British citizens who happened to be in Florida at the time and almost provokes a war with Britain. Well, Calhoun was Secretary of War at this time, and in cabinet meetings, Calhoun had proposed that Jackson should be court-martialed. Now that was kept very secret for a long time, but by the late 1820s, basically right as they are become president and vice president, Jackson finds out about that. And Jackson, if you know anything wow, about okay. Jackson, yeah, if you know anything about Jackson, you know that he was very sensitive about his honor. He believed still that he had done exactly the right thing in that situation. Um, and then, as soon as Jackson is elected, you have this whole, um, this social uh, scandal surrounding Peggy Eaton, the wife of John Eaton, uh, Jackson's Secretary of War, uh, who is a somewhat scandalous figure in Washington society. And unfortunately for Calhoun, it's Calhoun's wife, uh, Floride, who takes the lead in excluding Peggy Eaton from Washington society in, in 1828, 1829. And Jackson himself really likes the Eatons. He also associates Peggy Eaton with his late wife, Rachel, who had died right before he had been elected. And Jackson really believed that it had been some of the scandalous rumors circulating about Rachel that had, had led to her early demise, that it, that it had so wounded her that it had helped to kill her. And so he associates Peggy Eaton with his late wife. And when, when Calhoun's wife, Floride, attacks or excludes Peggy Eaton, this just widens the divide between Calhoun and uh, and Jackson. So, so there's the, the, personal. So as you're saying, there's personal, very deep personal <clears throat> bad blood between the vice president and the president. Yes. And then they have a serious constitutional conflict difference yes. on this right. issue. Uh, yes. What is Calhoun's argument for nullification? Because this is the one of the two things in the book that you identify as maybe the tenets, the two core tenets of his heresy. Tell yeah. us about Calhoun's argument for nullification. Yeah, this is a this is an idea that Calhoun will develop for the rest of his life. Um, but his argument was um, that the checks and balances in the American political system uh, were an, a fantastic invention but that the founders had overlooked. Uh, they had given the federal government some veto power over state uh, legislation, uh, but they had not given the states an effective way to veto in some situations federal legislation. And his idea about how this would work, <clears throat> uh, which he believed was constitutional, uh, but would obviously need people to act on it, and it's not spelled out anywhere in the Constitution, clearly, is um, that nullification had to be the work of a state uh, nullification convention, not the state legislature, because the conventions are the original source of political legitimacy and power in the American system. They were the, they were the you know, conventions had ratified the Constitution, 
And therefore, if a state convention nullified a federal law, you had a sort of uh, standoff. You had a you you had a tension. You had a, a question of where legitimacy rested in the system, right? And the way that that would be resolved, Calhoun believed, was by an appeal to all the other states in the uh, in the union. And if three quarters of the states agreed with uh, with the federal government, or in other words, if a state could not get at least a quarter of the other states to agree with it, right, um, then the federal government would would be granted the the power in question, or the issue would be settled in favor of the federal government. But if a state could convince uh, at least, you know, get a, a, a quarter of the states in the union to agree with it, um, then, the, then the federal government would have to back down. And of course, this is based, Cal in Calhoun's thinking, this is based on what you have to do to amend the constitution and, and uh, right, that process, right? So he says that, look, we already have a process for this. We just have to apply it to, to nullification. And in his view, this was the way that, that Americans could perfect the Constitution over time, because this may be surprising to people, but, but Calhoun very much believed that the Constitution was incomplete, uh, that it needed to be tested and perfected. He, he believed in what we might call political science. <laughs> he believed in politics as a science of testing the Constitution, seeing where there were issues that remained unsolved, and, and he thought that this would be a process that, that over time would produce a better constitution. So, Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. I'm Dr. John Moser, professor of history at Ashland University and chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. The MAG program is for teachers who want to master their craft by building content knowledge from original documents, from the words of those who lived and shaped our history, and not from textbooks or lectures. Our program is built around the discussion of original sources, and our faculty, both from both Ashland University and from across the country, is committed to this approach. We believe that the best way to get to know our past is to have a conversation with those who were there. James Madison, Frederick Douglass, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Theodore Roosevelt, and so many more. We offer two programs for working teachers and a broad selection of core and elective courses. You can learn more at tah.org slash programs. So, uh, and it's clearly, this view is clearly based on the idea that the union is the is really a compact of states, right? And that the states or the people of the states are the sovereigns and ultimately power is held by them, not the people of the United States who happen to live in states. Right. So as a corollary of, of the argument for nullification, Calhoun is a very strong proponent of exactly what you said, the compact theory of the Constitution. In fact, he, he probably becomes one of the most famous proponents of that uh, theory in the first half of the 19th century. And he's very sp specific that when the Constitution says we the people, he believes that it's referring to the people as the people of each state. So what's the collective. reaction when he articulates this, this constitutional doctrine and says, I, I'm going to propose uh, improving the founder's constitution. What's the reaction? Well, this is part of the reason why I think you can legitimately argue for him as a sort of heretic is that the reaction is no other state joined South Carolina when they actually put Calhoun's theories into practice in 1832 and nullified the law, the, the tariff. Uh, they, tr they, they would love for other states to join them. Nobody joins them. There is no movement to put Calhoun's theory into practice. Uh, there is only this uh, incredibly strong response from Andrew Jackson and the federal government uh, who basically threatened to invade South Carolina to enforce the law. Um, and even figures like James Madison, who in 1798 had been one of the authors of the, the he'd authored the Virginia Resolution, which was one of the 
intellectual constitutional precedents for Calhoun's theory. But Madison comes out against nullification and the theory and says, no, Calhoun is wrong um, about, about this. And uh, it is, you know, the people as a, as a whole, right, is who made the federal government. Um, and in a posthumous letter, when Madison dies, he leaves a, a, a posthumous letter to American citizens, essentially. And he, he doesn't reference Calhoun by name in the letter, but he makes references to uh, snakes in the American Garden of Eden, uh, disseminating dangerous political and constitutional theories. And Madison, by the end of his life, clearly thinks that it, if that Calhoun's theory would be the end of the Union, um, as it was, you know, in the 1820s and early 1830s. So, so that, uh, that's one really important aspect. Uh, and in fact, quarreling with the person the people call the founder, the father of the Constitution, right? <laughs> over constitutional theory. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty important, uh, it's a pretty important data point. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the other point that the other argument that you make in the book is, he also seems to turn from the American founders on the issue of slavery. Where, right. where What is Calhoun's thinking by the time we get to the 1830s on the issue of slavery? Yeah, um, well, uh, to, I think, again, here, context is incredibly important, right? So the 18, so by the 1830s, Calhoun is already uh, sidelined somewhat from national politics. I mean, he's a U.S. senator. He's very prominent. But um, at least during the 1830s, nobody is thinking of him as a presidential candidate. They will again in the 1840s, which is interesting. But um, uh, so he's kind of out of the political mainstream. Um, he is also paying close attention to the rise of abolitionist and anti-slavery sentiment in the 1830s. And I could tick off a couple, you know, the American Anti-Slavery Society is founded in 1831. Uh, there's a, a very um, a large slave rebellion, the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion in Virginia in 1831 that sort of sends shockwaves throughout the entire South. Um, and many people are afraid that that is because enslaved people are, be, are able to read abolitionist material. Uh, the big one uh, really in Calhoun's world is that Great Britain in 1833 abolishes slavery throughout its empire. And for many American slaveholders, that suddenly transforms the world into one where they feel on the defensive. And Calhoun had stayed away from slavery uh, for most of his career. He didn't write about it. Um, there were people that did in the 1820s. Um, but I think because he had national political aspirations, he just, he knew it was such a, a divisive topic that he stayed away from it. Um, but by the late 1830s, he is um, not satisfied to do that anymore. And uh, the the argument, the most popular argument up to that point about slavery in its defense had been the old necessary evil argument that people like Thomas Jefferson might have made, right? Which is Jefferson acknowledged that slavery was an evil, that it contradicted the principles of the United States, um, uh, but there was no good way to get rid of it, Jefferson said, right? There's an economically socially, right, this is still uh, the necessary evil argument is still a racist argument in the sense that, you know, Jefferson didn't believe that Black people could be integrated into the American state, and therefore there's no good solution to, uh, to, to freeing them. Um, and uh, there were people like Henry Clay, who was a slaveholder, who were part of the American Colonization Society, who saw the solution as um, freeing the slaves, but then uh, sending them back to Africa, essentially, although by that point, all of them had been born in America. Um, and Calhoun believes that this politically is not going to be, he, he senses a real political threat, a rising tide of anti-slavery, not just abolitionism, but the, the stuff that the historian James Oakes has written about um, that eventually is the political support for the Republican Party. 
that many, many Americans, many white Americans in the North had genuine anti-slavery uh, sentiments. And, and while they might not be abolitionists, they were very sympathetic to constraining slavery to where it was um, and very concerned about the, the, um, the ability of enslaved people to uh, escape or eventually be emancipated in some scenario. And uh, Calhoun believes that in that context, the necessary evil argument is a losing argument. You're on the defensive already as soon as you make it. And so he famously makes this 1837 speech in the U.S. Senate where he departs from that argument publicly and calls slavery a positive good. He says, I don't want to be, be understood as defending it as a necessary evil. It's a positive good. And his argument has several different components. Uh, one of them is political. Uh, he says, in a political system where, uh, where we want equality for as many people as possible, you are always going to need a subjugated class. Um, he says, there's no society in the history of the world that has not had this. And if we want equality for white people, we are going to have to subjugate someone. It is either going to be the white working classes, in which case our ideals of equality are uh, not going to be realized, or it is going to be in the South, enslaved black people of African descent. And that's preferable politically. Um, he sort of anticipates a lot of uh, Karl Marx's arguments about the conflict between working and uh, capitalist classes. And he says, uh, the rest of the world is gonna have to deal with this problem. The North is gonna have to deal with it. England is already dealing with it in the 1830s, but the South is not going to have to deal with it because of slavery. So economically, it's a, it's a sort of good for the, for the economy of the South. Um, and in fact, Calhoun says very, very frankly, he says um, American institutions as they exist cannot be fully accomplished or realized without slavery. Um, and when he says this on the U.S. Senate floor, another senator from Virginia, William Cable Rives, who had studied with Thomas Jefferson, so he, he knew what he was talking about, he stood up and, and basically said, the rest of us in the South don't want to be associated with this argument. Like we really? don't, we don't believe this. <laughs> uh, he says, I studied with Jefferson. I knew Madison. I, they knew George Washington and all of them believed that slavery was an evil. Right. Um, and that's what most of us still believe, even if we, you know, aren't getting rid of it or don't want to get rid of it. And uh, we don't want to be associated with this new argument that Calhoun is making. The irony, I think, so there's another argument for Calhoun as a heretic in his own time. Right, uh, right. Uh, the irony is, I think, that by the time of the Civil War, most slaveholders and, and white Southerners had moved further in Calhoun's position, towards Calhoun's position, than towards William Cable Rives. And th that's a story of like how a, a fringe political position can in fact become central over a couple decades. Well, that's very interesting to me because you're saying he makes this argument in the 1830s for the political, slavery is a positive good politically, slavery is a positive good economically. What about slavery as a positive good morally? Because the, the, as you said, other senators uh, you know, in the South and other public figures are saying, no, 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 we're not saying it's okay morally, but Calhoun yeah. seems to make the argument, in fact, it's a moral good. What's the argument that he makes? Yeah, I think here it's key to know that Calhoun had basically left uh, Christianity in any form behind. <laughs> uh, he had been raised a Presbyterian, but he became more or less a loose Unitarian by, by this point in his life. Um, but he was really... At his heart, he is a very, uh, he's devoted to, to, to reason. He believes he is scientific. Like the, these are the basis of his observations about the world.
And he makes it essentially, he says that slavery is moral because it, in a utilitarian sense, he believes it's good for both white and black people. So obviously it's good for white people. In Calhoun's idea, it's going to help white people be more equal across the board if there's a subjugated class. Um, but he believes that that generationally there has been, his argument is there has been a uh, a sort of moral and ethical improvement in black people, in enslaved people under slavery. And this wasn't a completely uncommon argument, um, right? The, the argument that enslaved people were better off in the United States than they were in Africa. But Calhoun's argument is there, there's actually progress happening, right? That black people are, are making progress. We see them making progress. Now, when he makes that argument, he doesn't address uh, the looming question, which is how much progress would be enough to justify emancipation, right? So right, right. he wants to justify it morally by saying there's progress, but there's not enough yet to justify emancipation. Um, the, the other thing about, about his argument that I always think about is uh, in the book, I write about the family of a, a man named Adam who was enslaved to Calhoun's father. And Calhoun had seen three generations of this family by, by the 1830s. He had grown up with, uh, with um, Adam's son, whose name was Sawney. And by the 1830s, Sawney was old Sawney and had a family of his own. And one of old one of um, old Sawney's daughters, a, a enslaved woman named Issy, in the 1830s, we are relatively sure, tried to burn down Calhoun's house with his family inside it. So this is a this is a, a woman who had was part of a long-standing attachment to Calhoun's family, but was enslaved. And that would seem a real contradiction to Calhoun's arguments. Like he so there, there's a tension between sort of even how he experienced slavery, which is he knew about slave resistance. He knew that people wanted, you know, at some level, he knew people wanted freedom, uh, but he's still making these arguments uh, publicly that it's, a, that it's a moral good for everyone. And what about the argument that undoubtedly abolitionists were making, but others who weren't abolitionists, as you said, but just sort of in their hearts and minds, their sentiment was slavery is wrong. And many of them would go back to the Declaration of Independence and say, well, look at Thomas Jefferson said right. all men are created equal. Congress ratified it and adopted. Jefferson was publicly, we all know, thought slavery was an evil. We ought to be guided by that old document. What? How does Calhoun respond to those kind of arguments? Yeah, oh, that's a, that's a great question, Jeff. Um, so... Calhoun always sees himself as an accolade, as a follower of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, that is one of his political, you know, North Stars throughout his, uh, throughout his life, except on that single issue. So he believes by the 1830s and 1840s that Jefferson was simply wrong about this. Uh, and in the 1840s, he finally, five years before he dies, he finally gives a speech where he says, Jefferson was right about all this other stuff, but he is completely wrong about this, these ideas of natural equality. Um, that is not how the world works. And that idea is the source of all of our political problems today. And he, he even goes further than that. And he says, you actually have to go back to John Locke who also was wrong. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah, he says he says you can trace this awful idea from the abolitionists to Jefferson back to Locke and they were all wrong about this idea that that they um you know they got it wrong and therefore we're getting it wrong today or some people are getting it wrong. So uh, to the so extent that so the extent that as Martin Luther King Jr called the declaration sort of our the American creed using that religious language, here Calhoun says that first self-evident truth of the creed, we have to reject. Yes, absolutely. And I don't want to make that sound, you know, there were still 
a lot of people in the United States in the 1830s and 1840s who didn't view the Declaration with as much veneration as we do today. I mean, it 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 was certainly well known and 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 popular. Calhoun was not the only one to say things like that. There were conser political conservatives in the North, even who would have said a, a softer version of that, right? They 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 might have said a softer version of that. But Calhoun says it directly in, in you know, defending slavery. Um, he says, as long as we have this uh, belief that all men are created equal, and as long as we put that into operation by saying they all deserve the same political rights and freedom, we are we are going to we are on a path of conflict because uh, that that does threaten slavery. I mean, he, he's very honest about that. <laughs> so so th that raises to my mind, it raises the question then of the legacy of John C. Calhoun, because mm -hmm. you've already alluded to the fact that his argument uh, for slavery as a positive good starts to really take hold in a lot of people's minds in the South in the 1840s and 50s. He passes away early in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. In your mind, um, this American heretic, what's his legacy? Yeah, well, there's kind of short-term and long-term answers to that. Um, the the short-term one is uh, that I don't think it's accurate to blame Calhoun for the Civil War, which is something that is frequently done. Um, he died in 1850, as you said. He was a staunch Unionist his entire life. He did not want secession. Um, but it's also true that his political ideas and his defense of slavery do set the stage for that. So I, I tell students to imagine if you were a slaveholder who believed slavery was a necessary evil, you might be willing to compromise on that, right? You might be willing to, to agree under some circumstances to gradual emancipation. But if you believe it's a positive good, and that um, that it's the basis of your your political freedom as a as a white American slaveholder, you're not you're not going to compromise on that, right? It, it sort of eliminates that ground. And the other, obviously, the constitutional theory of the compact theory, the idea that states and the people of states are the ultimate source of political authority. As, as many good arguments as there are for that, it also is the fundamental core logic of secession. Um, that, you know, given, given any other, uh, you know, that, that a state could secede legally, which Calhoun did believe, he didn't want that to happen. So in the, in the short term, I'd say that, there, that he does contribute in specific ways to the Civil War, although he, not in ways that he would have wanted in some ways. Long term, in the book, I, I bring up sort of his how his legacy has kind of surfaced in unexpected ways, especially especially in the late in the last twenty years, honestly. Yeah, and I um, found this part of your book fascinating. What is this unexpected modern legacy of John C. Calhoun? Yeah, this is part of the reason that that I wrote the book is that for uh, for a, a couple decades, even historians had basically been arguing, you know, Calhoun is basically belongs in the dustbin of history. His constitutional theories is his certainly his defense of slavery. Um, but all of a sudden in 2015, it, it actually happened. This is one way that it resurfaces. Um, the, the horrific shootings in Charleston at Mother Emanuel Church happened in June of 2015. And it was after that, um, the next morning, somebody had uh, vandalized a statue to Calhoun in Charleston, connecting the shooting to his legacy of defending slavery. And those protests just spread. So the, the, they spread to Yale University, where there was a college named after him. They spread to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where there was a lake named after him. Um, and so all of a sudden, he was being directly related to this, this uh, resurgence of sort of racism in our society, right? So all of a sudden, for those of us who knew about him, that was just very weird that this figure was suddenly resurfacing and being connected to that. But even more unexpected, I think, is the resurfacing of, um, of some of Calhoun's uh, political and constitutional theories in the modern world. So by the end of his life, he's extrapolated from the his theory of nullification and the compact theory uh, 
the idea of uh, what he called the concurrent majority or the consensus majority. And this was the idea that at the heart of constitutional government uh, should be the, the ideal of consensus. And from this, he extrapolates that um, every major part of society, whether those are states or interest groups or professions, um, should have a veto over major legislation in that society. So the, the idea of the minority veto is one of his, uh, the ways that, that he uh, kind of extrapolates on the theories of nullification by the end of his life. So the idea that minorities should have a veto power. Um, there is a, there's a political scientist, a Dutch political scientist who picks up on this theory in the 1970s uh, and creates a field called consociational democracy that then influences the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland, which institutes a, uh, a diarchy, a, a, a two president structure, two executives, essentially, both of whom have veto power. This is a way, of course, to, to resolve the conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, and that is a direct application of what Calhoun proposed at the end of his life. He proposed a northern and southern president really? uh, to resolve the uh, to resolve the sectional conflict. And this is instituted in Ireland. <laughs> um, oh, okay. and, and you can draw a direct line. I mean, it's not an inference. You can draw a direct line um, from that arrangement back to Calhoun's theories. Another surprising one is um, a, a woman named Lanny Guineer, who is, was the first woman of color tenured at Harvard Law School. And in 1994, I believe it was, she published a book called The Tyranny of the Majority, in which she proposed that, uh, that some minority groups in the United States, like African Americans, should essentially have a versions of this minority veto power in some situations over legislation. And her arguments, as some people pointed out in the 1990s, are very similar, uh, very, very similar to Calhoun's. Um, so those are just two ways that it's that it sort of has resurfaced in yeah. very unexpected ways recently. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, um... Professor Robert Elder, thank you so much for taking the time to reacquaint us with this really important, interesting, and obviously controversial um, American figure that it behooves, I think, all of us to know more about. Um, for our listeners, let me remind you of the book, John C. Calhoun, American Heretic by Professor Robert Elder. It's a terrific book. It's a terrific read. It really brings history alive and, as Bob was just saying, shows the important legacy of Calhoun continuing on even to this day. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Professor. Thanks, Jeff, it was a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.